Can you all smell the smell of cabbage off me? Like, can you smell that I'm Irish? Is that, is that, <laughs> through on? the computer, Tom. Yeah, through. Smell a vision. That's, that's some loud, dank cabbage. Hello, and welcome to the second episode of our Understanding Class by Eric Olin Wright Reading Group series. Today is Sunday, the 30th of May 2021, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. We actually begin Chapter 1 today, the Google Slides to which are included in the show notes. This week, I have the new patrons Future.Rat, Katochny, James Delaney, Adam Nickel, Marine, PGH Rock and Roll Magic, and the returning Mason Kerr to thank. And a very big shout out to Jordan Friedland, who has edited both this and the previous Understanding Class episode. Muchos, 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 muchos gracias, Jordan. If you like the sound of extra patron-only episodes, hanging out with us all on the Emancipation Network Discord server, or joining in the patrons' Fundamental Principles of Communist Production Distribution Reading Group, why not head over to the Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars? Okay. Let's hit it. Okay, are we ready to move on? Let's go on to chapter one. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so this chapter is called Towards an Integrative Analysis. So basically, he's going to have a little look at each of those uh, layers that we just talked about. The first being the stratification, then the opportunity hoarding, and then like the mass uh, exploitation and domination layers. So let's have a look here first at stratification. Kyle, how do you feel about taking this slide? Sure. Um, yeah, so regarding stratification, this is uh, one of the approaches we talked about already. Uh, so it's based on mostly attributes. Uh, so, sorry, is it attributes or attributes? It's... <laughs> I, I never learned it properly which of those it is. Uh, attributes. attributes. Attributes, thank you, yeah. Uh, so here in this approach, which is generally like what we've been describing as a liberal approach, class is neither identified simply with the indiv individual nor with the material conditions of the life of people, but with the interconnection between these two. Uh, so you have these very sort of like complex descriptions. The key attributes here, education is the major one uh, that people point to. Uh, as like determinative of what your situation is going to be in life. And some sociologists include cultural resources, social connections, so, uh, even uh, up to the point of individual motivations. And then uh, these clusters of attributes among individuals make up classes. Clusters of individuals and material conditions of life are called classes. So. You know, you could have, say, like the country club set, right? Oh, these are people who belong to a country club. They can afford that. They live in this part of town. They play golf or they play some adjacent game. Uh, you know, they have these kinds of business connections, et cetera, et cetera. That's your definition of class. So it's like, it's very like intuitively understandable because. When you think about like class resentment, like this is often what people point to, like, oh, you country club asshole, right? Yeah, I think this is a what like the way it's defined here is like um, the stratification model. It does kind of map on to like what I was talking about here, but distinction, except yes. that also this ties to income in a way that is a little bit hard to deal with. But yeah, like cultural resources, social connections, and education, and but again, this actually shows how these uh, interact with each other because when you get to Weberian stuff and opportunity hoarding, education is the main legal. I mean, I know it, it sounds weird because we're talking about skills, but credentialing is often just a legal way of cartelization. And education is totally tied into that in our current society in a yes. way that's like highly destructive, actually. Yeah, so um, he explicitly says in this chapter that Bourdieu's work uh, straddles the stratification approach and the Weberian approach. Yeah, and he does sometimes use Bourdieuian as the 
stand in for stratification, even with that qualification. So like that is there. Although I think uh, Wright would put the gradations of income strictly in the stratification approach because he has like a little table that we skipped on page 10. That's like, you know, like this, like, let's, let's see. Okay. I do, I, do I not get to it? Uh, I'm trying to see, do I get to it? Uh, this one. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Okay, we're going but, to get um, to it. Okay, great. Yeah, just the point is that um, income radiation and the whole like way of looking at class that isn't you know fundamentally relation based. That's all mashed into the stratification, and so income would be you know the most substantial, economically substantial. Okay, thing in stratification essentially. Like, yeah, it, it's just that oftentimes your opportunity hoarding is identified primarily by an attribute you have, right? Like Derek, Derek was saying, being credentialed puts you in a group that is opportunity hoarding. Okay, yeah, so we kind of talked a bit through this. We talked about the different stratification. Like one thing, like it is kind of funny, like, you know, libs, you know, one thing I'd like to ask uh, somebody who might know some about this, like in what way is education becoming less of a thing for allowing you to get up into these upper stratifications? Is that that link seems to be breaking down? It both is and isn't. So if it, this is literally my day job, so I can speak on it pretty accurately. Education is increasingly required for jobs that did not require education. So there is a punitive mechanism now for not having it. And I think that that's a better way to understand it than a benefit to having education. Um, this is something also a lot of when we talk about like the post leftists, they deliberately ignore this. They'll cite the aggregate stat that like two thirds of Americans don't have education they ignore that that is not true. If you look at under 35s where it, that literally flips um, almost, I think it's something like 60 to 65% have some level of college education, because if you entered the labor market in the 1980s, jobs that used to require not even a high school education. I mean, I worked with people when I worked at Geico 20 years ago, I was literally starting this job when they were doing this shift where you could go into Geico to work certain jobs with, uh, with a high school education. And your boss would also just be high school education, or maybe be a high school dropout. Whereas now to get the same job, you needed at least an associate's degree, if not more. Um, so you, the education is no longer allowing you into the upper echelons unless you were already in the upper echelons and have access to Ivy league education, because as more and more people get educated, it as a commodity becomes less of a useful door into the upper class or the middle class or whatever, uh, because there's, I hate to sound like Peter Tinchin, but there's, a, you know, there's interleague competition, which pushes the credentialing down. And that actually moves the criterion from, so if you look at like this, upper class, lower class, under, I, I think it's weird that he lives out middle class, but whatever. Um, I don't think he actually does, does he? I think it's in the book. Okay. Well, he, he has a whole like kind of empirical breakdown of classes where the middle class is ironed out but that's in the preface i keep blurring what's in the preface and the first uh, chapter. this this is also in this chapter because i only read chapter one to prep for this and there's definitely a discussion of the middle class okay okay great so yeah. so the what used to be required to get into the upper class is now required to get into the middle class what used to be required to get into the middle class when i'll get you into the lower middle class and that does have to do with um you know, what someone like Peter Turchin would call elite, which I think is totally misleading overproduction because it's not really that elites are being overproduced. It is that you have increased competition for, for a similar or even smaller amount of elite spots. Uh, Kyle, you are correct. I missed just, I just missed putting the, the middle class into that. Uh, that's my fault. Um, so just All assume right. that's there. Um, I'm not going to put it in now. Fuck it. Um, um, Trafication, Purdue, economic, cultural, social capital. Yeah. Yeah, so he he talks a bit here about the yeah the stratification of uh, Pierre Bourdieu. Who wants to describe who this uh, French geezer is? I can because I'm I highly influenced him. Pierre Bourdieu is a French sociologist um, who was strongly influenced by Marx, but kind of differentiated himself 
um, in the 1970 from the Marxist school, who was actually concerned with empirical studies of the classes in France. He also looked at the way culture worked as a code of gatekeeping and how like social capital could get you. The one thing that I think Pierre, Pierre Bourdieu is often taught wrong in the United States, where cultural, social, and economic capital are seen as distinct, whereas Pierre Bourdieu actually sees cultural and social capital as actual means to economic capital. Um, they're not completely separate categories. And I was a little confused about if Owen Wright was actually spreading the misinterpretation in this book um, of what's going on. Because if you read Pierre Bourdieu's most famous book, Distinction, that is largely what he's writing about. So, for example, the Marxist debate around PMC, right, which is a totally incoherent class category, like it really is, even from this perspective, and I, I've ranted about why, but it feels real to most people because it is the way they experience um, this downward push of credentialing and the fact that you, there's more punitive for not having education, but you get less and less for having it, where there seems to be an increase of importance, particularly in lefty spheres and social and cultural capital. And I will also say that there are a lot of things in which, I mean, I hate to say it, but like anti-racist, anti-sexist, I don't really hate to say it, I'll be honest. Anti-racist, anti-sexist language games on the left are forms of social and cultural capital. Particularly yeah, I think it's locked on, on very few people. <laughs> uh, right. You know, like that, like it's, you know. I don't know. I, th I think, Esri, it's lost on most people. <laughs> Like it is not really, seen. yeah. Because like, I, I I sometimes wonder if we don't just talk to a lot of like, you know, people that are super righteous about it. Because I think people that are not like politically aligned or something, but even have like a sort of sociological interest in you know just because who they are in like anti racism, anti sexism, you know, being pro queer or whatever, can also tell when someone is pandering to them. I. I feel like yeah, but most, this is all I feel like most people feel this. They do. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. It's like, I feel like, it's like the difference I, between somebody just like not being an asshole <laughs> and being like, <laughs> right. and being like some kind of annoying. Uh, right. Making a big show yeah. of it. Like, I think this is something that within the left or even left sympathetic people become sort of like intentionally stupid about because it makes it hard to deal with expressions of our values <laughs> otherwise. Well, I, I see what you're saying, but I think when I teach high school, people do not see this as expressions of cultural and social capital. They see it as common courtesy. But it is interesting to me that you do have to have a background of a certain education level to use the right words. And the biggest expression of this that people make a big deal of right now is Latinx, which I actually personally don't use. I tend to use Latin or Latin to still respect the gender neutrality, but not use a very strange in the native language and in English um, created term because it doesn't have any influence in larger um, Latin society in the United States hardly at all. It is specific to an educated class and study after study shows this. And that educated class isn't even that Latin. Honestly. Well, right. So, Do you think that's like law? So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, broadly speaking, and maybe this is a case that is really visible, right? That Latin American people, when they see Latinx, you know, how do they feel? I think they feel it as alien. For the so, part. and I'm kind of extrapolating from this. I think this is the relationship that most people have to these sort of signifiers. Oh, okay. So we, we're kind of agreeing, but kind of like, I'm saying that I don't think people realize it's cultural capital, like in any articulate way, including people who promote it. Okay. I don't think I don't think that people promoting this language think they're promoting a form of cultural capital either. I don't. Like I think they're acting in good faith. There's a small I, amount of them that are probably aware, but I think you're mostly right. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I do think when um, someone says "stay in your lane," that that's pure cultural capital stuff. That's what that is. Yeah, um, I, I've seen I've seen that kind of, you know, sharp elbow shit too much to think that people are completely unconscious of this. Um, however, I do think that this is probably it's yeah. 
it's a sort of quintessential internet experience or whatever to get really caught up in something that seems to share your values only to feel outcompeted and elbowed out of the way about it in a way that kind of harms your relationship with your own values. Do you think it's just internet? Because one thing that PH Higgins no, says in the comments, I don't think it's just. Like, I don't think I don't think it's just internet, but like you need a certain amount of, of exposure to people with your own values or that claim to have your own values in order to have this experience. So you could, you know, move to the big city before the internet and have this experience or something, or go to school the, and have this one experience. Of the but that, you can have any opinion and go to the internet and be swamped with people that have your opinion. Okay. You know, that's the difference. So this experience is more universally accessible. So one thing I'll say about this, uh, two things it brings up to my mind. One is PH was talking, uh, PH Higgins in the chat was talking about how Pierre Bourdieu was actually analyzing the French Communist Party's use of its own institutions and social networking to get capitalist clout um, and to get opportunity in business and whatnot, which we also see pretty clearly in leftist stuff now. The other thing that I would say, though, and this is one of the things where the punishment for not having education becomes more obvious is that the value of these key terms and the internet has decreased. Like when we talk about these terms in the early aughts and in the nineties, when I was just in college, you pretty much did have to have a college education to have encountered the term, I don't know, heteronormative. You did. And that is no longer true for good and ill. I think it's good that these ideas are out there, but I think it's also like, it also creates a kind of, um, a red queen game on these terms that didn't exist before. And I do think we see it on the left. Like it is almost impossible to keep up with the improper nomenclature and it does give you access to real capital. I mean, I think that's like explicit. Yeah. Or, or deny you access to capital. Like, yeah. Uh, I mean, what is canceling? But like, I mean, if, if, you, if you are in the media sphere mm -hmm. of any kind, you're probably terrified about this because you can lose real capital, real economic opportunities because you weren't sophisticated enough. Or you can lean into it and get the big books. Let's be honest. What's the dirt bag left? No, I actually, Tom, I think if you go into like real media sphere, you do not get big bucks from going down into conservative sphere. It's just because we're in the shit end of the stick where there's no money is where it looks like it's appealing. Like people like come town and all that, like yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. They, yeah, they, but they, they lean into being the opposite of that. They just do like there's no getting around it. Like their language they use is the same language as I would have used growing up. You know, that's the same sense of humor. Well, yeah, like I mean, it's, it's hard. It's hard to articulate that this is. Um, I want to say like a small sphere thing, and I know come town is pretty big podcast, but like. It only works because they're counter signaling, you know, the whole dirtbag thing only really works because of the weird special dynamics of like leftist media and, and the fact that there is such a rock star job market in there. And I guess they're all rock star job markets. And what I mean by that is, you know, a million wannabes for everyone who makes it. But the fact that you could be one of the top 20 podcasts in Patreon or something, or you could be. You know, you could be number one podcast on Patreon if you win the leftosphere. You could be the number one Patreon <laughs> versus, you know, what most people make. Like that, that makes it somehow unique. Because I don't know. So sometimes I wonder if I'm generalizing too much, but you're probably not going to make number one Patreon being a Minecraft podcast or something. No, you're, you're you know probably I mean? not. But also no, number one Patreon is how many, how many dollars a month? True crime, true crime, and it's like about one hundred and seventy thousand dollars a month. Yeah, and then you get into a right, podcast, right. which is which is a lot less. But you sprick that down, you figure that out, and then you look at what, like, say, an old media figure, even in a dying sclerotic market, which is why there's so much push in. It's why there's so much push into the left superstar market. Let's be honest; like, you increasingly see like people on the dirtbag left with Ivy League degrees. And who had heavy investors putting money into their Patreon to inflate it in the beginning as an investment app. I mean, like, people, this is how this works. So the reason why that is, though, is because the real money, real capture, real social clout, all that stuff um, for more people, is it, it's actually in the standard liberal media, in which case counseling does affect you. 
I'm also going to say, like, I think one of the reasons why this has become such a lefty of weird obsession is because it's weaponizing something negative about, frankly, middle class culture for good and ill. But it is essentially a middle class strata issue. And it doesn't work on certain people like like you counseling me from the Internet. Easy counseling me from my job for a leftist to do really hard. And a right winger could actually probably do it a lot easier, frankly. Um, so it's one of those things where, like, we get caught up in this, and this is why I'm I get tired of the council culture debates because it it gets us playing into these two strata, or these two being cultural and social capital, without dealing with the fundamental problems of these two strata, and without like um, dealing with the larger economic problems. It just it just seems so myopic to a very tiny portion of the economy yeah it's a very middle class thing you're absolutely right yeah which i think yeah i, I guess like the media sphere see i'm trying to like figure out you know from the inside i guess how much of left media dynamics is a general operating of class and how much of it is kind of special because of the subject matter how much is it form how much is it content um so yeah anyway i think we uh, should keep going uh, on with the I, general I think question. the la the last thing I will say about that is just that because of the relationship between the left thought and credentialing, there's an overwhelming bias for those two things to be connected, right? No, no, no. That's that's great. That's a great point. And a Weberian sort of point, mostly. Except for if you go to the right university, you know, in like a Bordeauxian sense or something, I guess. Right, but this is why I think you know people are talking about the post left right now, which again I'm fucking tired of. But um, this is why they have so much purchase with a certain amount of like people who are like real workers, even though the class war that they're concerned about doesn't actually involve the working class at all. It's it's if you actually read them closely, it's explicitly between different elite groups. And I will say that when I was looking at this, uh, the Great British class survey the one thing i found interesting is that it doesn't deal with things like uh let's, let's go through elite established middle class technical middle class new affluent workers traditional working class emergent service workers and precariat you'll notice that like shop owners and stuff are not even on it like they don't they don't even exist in it yeah like uh they don't really exist in england do they really <laughs> you know it like say for example you go in london hang on the the nation of shopkeepers doesn't have <laughs> shopkeepers yeah like i'm deadly serious they don't exist like you look in the 1970s there was a really big um british comedy uh open all hours about like this northern uh i have seen it yeah with uh ronnie corbett and the guy who plays del boy from uh only fools and horses and like you know it's a small shop and there's two white guys working in the shop granville and his uncle and they're like you know blah 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 hilarious whatever but like you go to london now or go to any northern town i'm sure it's the same anywhere else you will never ever see a english white person working in a corner shop it doesn't happen. Whatever has happened to like that whole class of English society now, I don't know. Are they chains? Are they small little uh, ownership? Usually, they're like um, Asian, you know, Indians, subcontinent people from there. It's like that whole class of small little petty bourgeois in England. I don't know where it is. Like in London, it hardly exists. And then, a lot and of those people are probably folded into precariat. Honestly, I was saying the. If, it, yeah, if you're thinking about what kind of income they're making, they're probably not having a good time. For the yeah, same, like, the, go ahead, Tom. No, like uh, those corner shops, they can only survive because they're usually run by like an Asian family who has is probably getting paid super low, doing super long hours, and I think a lot of the time they're actually owned by some rich Indian relative or Indian capital, and they're getting paid. You know, they're probably getting, not getting paid minimum wage. They're working so, crazy hours. They would probably be in the precariat or six emergent service workers. That would probably where they would lie. So I find it interesting that an American would use the British class survey, though, because um, that trend in the United States is similar. If you go into cities, most of the owners of small shops are immigrants. There's two reasons for that. Yeah. Um, one of the things for we talk about all the wokeness of big capital. It's still not woke enough to hire a lot of workers who don't speak very good English. 
And those workers tend to open up their own small businesses. And they do okay, actually, in certain parts of the United States. They're also, once you get out of cities, you still meet boutique shop owners and small business owners, particularly truckers, actually, in the U.S., which is a much bigger sector. Like, it is the largest sector of employment. Um, and I put employment because a lot of them are not technically employed um, in the United States. So you have this large, we do have a large petite bourgeois. This is a mixture of immigrants and rural boutique stuff, rural and suburban, actually more rural, rural and extreme suburban boutique stuff that you don't seem to have in Europe in the same way. And when a lot of Americans talk about the traditional working class, they lump a lot of these PB people into that in the yeah. strata. Like I would say as well here, in case like you're not so familiar, like in, in England, middle class means really, really goddamn rich. Yeah. Yeah, if you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, for example, like the, the, who's the, what's the name of you one who married um, the Prince William, uh, Kate Middleton. Right. Like she would technically be called middle class. Right. Where, where like millionaires. The, Whereas in America, we define middle class, literally, I think at some point, define middle class as between like 10K under the median income, which is like 40K and above per year, all the way up to like $350,000 per year in income. Because they have, they do kind of have it stratified in that way. Um, and so the middle class in the United States is defined unbelievably broadly. Yeah, um, it's defined broadly, so you don't have to ever say working class. You just have middle class. Like in England, middle class actually yeah. means like I would say established middle class means people with at least probably no joke and probably at least five million pounds worth of assets, or maybe oh, wow. maybe yeah maybe two million pounds worth of assets. But established middle class are people that go to Eton and things like that. You know. Yeah. So so this is interesting to me because it's one of those things where the American left and the British left are I was talking about to each other and using the same words and mean completely different shit by them. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Incommensurability in the same language because of national framework. You'll have right. to see it. Lex Whitfield in the chat just said like, uh, they called whatever her name is, uh, no, Middleton, Kate Middleton, a commoner before the marriage. That's what true. Is, She's that's the first princess, oh com God. commoner princess. What's well, because oh England God. never completed its, even its pathetic and anemic bourgeois revolution by properly getting rid of its caste system, which is why like, right. I was always more tolerant of like um, Mark Fisher talking about working class and cultural terms because I was like, oh, that makes sense in England because you still have nobility in a real legal way um, where we don't, and yet we're... I don't know. Are we more unequal than Britain? That's actually hard to say. Uh, um, I think the most Probably. unequal. Similar. Yeah, I think there's quite similar. Uh, yeah, the it's, unequal... it's the two most unequal in the OECD are US and Britain. Right, and the most unequal on Earth is uh, the most Gini coefficient unequal on Earth is China. Yeah. So Brazil yeah. is not far behind it. It's interesting you say that because... Um, Oh, no, it's just interesting, like, because, like, I know Precious here, when she bought the house, she bought her house on a freehold. Like, most of the property in London, like, is leasehold. So you buy the house, and all you're buying right. is a 100-year lease. And you have to keep paying money to renew this lease to, like, Lord, whichever the what. Like, it's proper feudal relations. Like, you go, like, the centre, all of London, all, like, the richest man in Britain is uh, Lord Westminster. And he basically owns all of the center of London. He literally owns the whole thing. Complete your bourgeois yeah. revolution. Yeah. And, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> need, yeah, the English need a, a bourgeois revolution, you know? Like, Finish it. He didn't check the box. Finish. He didn't check the full box. I'll get them going. <laughs> it's interesting here, like, because in, in the UK, like, this language of the precariat is all dominant in the left in the UK. That the left in the UK is basically you know, the kind of labor right left, it fully falls into this worldview of stratification, like Novara media analysis and all this precariat. Oh my God. Oh, the guardian. Like this is the stuff they talk about. So 10 years ago, yeah. it was a big deal here. Yeah. We gave okay. it up. I didn't know that. I didn't know it was big over there too. Yeah. Well, the thing was with the precariat is, is interesting is like, it actually does describe what's happening to a lot of people. I, I'm pointing as if the people can see it. Um, in, in categories four, five, and six, all those people 
in the United States are potentially gig workers, even people who are somewhat established. Like, like the, the whole debate are like our teachers workers because we, and it, I, some people will even define it on income because teachers are weird. We are highly credentialed and we make no money for our credentials. But if you look at us in the aggregate of all jobs in the United States, we are just slightly dead above center. Now, there are certain states where teachers really are a labor aristocracy, as we used to live in one. But uh, um, in general, teachers do slightly better than most hourly workers with a full-time job, but only slightly. And given their debt loads, they tend to need to take on more work. So they do tend to be precarious. And also, they don't tend to say teachers. I mean, the, I think 50% of all teachers quit the job within three years. And they don't tend to go up in class once they quit pointing that out so yeah and i think the reason why i don't use precarious anymore and is unless you're independently wealthy in the united states you are like we have downward class mobility as a threat at all times all the time constantly <laughs> like, <laughs> that's the way it should be that's the way it should be let's get it straight and um, we want to keep this working working hard um classic marxist immiseration esque here yeah okay let's let's go on to the next slide here uh let me read this um so he says it's important to understand how people acquire the attributes of place them in one class or another. These are like the these stratified classes we've just talked about. The economic status is based on their employment. Focus on the process which people acquire the cultural, motivational and educational resources that affect their occupations in the labor market. Particular uh, attention is given to the early conditions of life, you know, your family and the class character of the family settings is just key to how these attributes are acquired. So, so there's like this really big emphasis on your parents. Are they like into education or are they rich? It seems to you like it, it links your, your status in the world to your employment. You know, how many people can get these jobs? Like what, what's the qualification you need to do to become a, like say the Lord of Westminster you know, Earl of Westminster, Duke of Westminster. Like, how can I get that accreditation? <laughs> Anybody know? Yeah, marry a princess. Yeah. I mean, this is, again, it kind of gets into that opportunity hoarding, right? Like, the aristocracy are obviously opportunity hoarding. <laughs> yeah. Everything is opportunity hoarding. Your clothes. Your clothes are opportunity hoarding. <laughs> Actually, well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, no, like, I'm joking. I'm joking. You know, <laughs> when they call Kate Middleton a commoner, you know, that's an active form of opportunity hoarding as opposed to just but by, you know, attributing that to her. The activity is opportunity hoarding. I guess I could maybe frame some of this in a way that stratification is the way by which opportunity hoarding and, you know, class exploitation and domination are lived. Like, unless you're looking at the balance sheet, you're not seeing exploitation, you know, unless you're like really thinking about relations between you and the boss, you're not thinking about domination. And, and like, importantly, like, as it says in that table, the stratification approach is non-relational. Right. So, so when you get to like, how does that happen through relations, you're often making reference to the other two. Right. Like opportunity hoarding is probably the one that, or domination, probably the ones that will like kind of occur to people more than exploitation as the structural characteristics. But it's all kind of worked out on the individual level and, you know, dealing with people's smugness or their like sense of entitlement or alternately, you know, their sense of, you know, that they're not entitled to anything and, you know, being like, whoa, what let's, is let's that? Have, let's have a look here. This is, uh, this is Kate Middleton's parents' house. This is their 1.5 million mansion in the countryside. Sit there with like their exterior garage, three-story house with like a couple of SUVs in the yard. Their house is worth 1.5 million. So that'll give you an extension of what like what, what counts as a commoner in England. Are you saying they only have one guard quarters? That's it? That's it. Like, I think so. Like, gosh, yeah. And they all the, yeah, yeah. yeah, no wonder the British and the Americans think they understand each other and really don't ever. Like when somebody in England says middle class, that's what they actually mean. They mean like somebody who owns 
houses like that in the country. So it's such a different term. Um, that is what we used to mean in the United States before the housing crisis. Like you no. could have a big McMansion in the sticks. I swear to yeah, God. But, yeah, but, no, no, but not like that. No. I mean, like, you can't compare a house like that in England to a house like that in America because everything, like... No, that's very fair, fair, fair. Yeah, like, that's just a whole different kind of thing. I fair, did fair. see some of the things built in Georgia right before the housing crash. We would have never considered someone who owned a house that big, middle class. Yeah. <laughs> middle class is such a, like, broad, vague category that it people that lived in those houses did think of themselves as middle class, but, like, upper oh, middle or something. Yeah, that's true. That's probably fair. Yeah. I think, like, probably, like, in, in British terms, just everybody was in the underclass, let's be honest. <laughs> They're all ruffians. Like, uh, like you know, so the extremely wealthy people were the middle. Um, okay, so he really likes these kind of diagrams in the book. Uh, before I got the uh, actual copy of the book, I had to build the diagrams. So I have a PDF, and now I can just copy and paste them. But I built this one here. So this is, like, a diagram where he has, like, you know, some arrows and some He's trying to explain the process that stratification theorists kind of understand how they understand class. So it goes from one bubble. The first bubble says various social background conditions in an individual's life. Then that leads to class relevant attributes of individuals. And that goes on to your job or your occupations. And that goes on to your levels of individual economic well being. So, like, entirely missing from any of this is like, any type of Weberian, so hoarding, you know, trying to keep other people out of certain types of jobs or roles or the relations of production, any exploitation or anything. It's situating things nearly entirely in like this individual has this type of family and this type of education. They get this type of job and then this is their pay. That's yeah, the, the way, that's their understanding. The only kind of relations that this approach is interested in is how attributes relate to attributes. Right. Although that confuses me that that uh, this is what I was talking about, his misunderstanding of uh, Bourdieu, because Bourdieu doesn't think that at all for this stuff. He does see relations of both production and consumption, actually, as being vital to how this works. And so I guess that's what he means by saying Bourdieu straddles the Viberian and the stratification approach. But I'd be like, in practice, I actually think it's a different approach. Um, yeah, it it seems yeah. to me like the one thing he says here, Derek, I kind of feel it too, but he said here for Pierre Boudour that the three dimensions of economically relevant resources are it's which individuals possess. So even though he talks about economic capital, cultural capital, social capital, it's in the individual and not in the class. Is that his point for any? Yeah, I guess. I mean, and, but that's because Bardu is trying to talk about the way the individual's taste and psychology and even their experience of things like symbolic violence, a term that has been much abused on the left, and I'm actually probably going to do a video explaining on Monday, um, comes up because it's the individual experience of something that is relational in a system that the individual experiences. And so it's trying to phenomenologicalize, you know, it's like a sociological phenomenology. Like you are likely to experience this because of these systems because of your relation as an individual to the system. So I, I think it's kind of a misreading to say that he thinks that it's actually the individuals that are setting this up. It's just that that's how you experience it. And that's, to be completely honest, that is how you experience it. You don't experience anything as an aggregate. So like... Yeah. Anyway, good. let's go on. I don't, I don't, I just want to make sure that other theorists of class are fairly represented. We could say this generally about Bordeauxians or something. Mm. Like, I don't know if the late Bourdieu ends up stressing the different kinds of capitals or something, but it's certainly something that I've seen out there that, oh, Pierre Bourdieu, you know, I guess perpetuating the Anglo reading of Bourdieu, you know, has these three categories of capital and let's use this to get around economic capital. That's the exact kind of maneuver I would expect people to do with someone who's originally trying to enrich Marxist class sociology or whatever. And I think you're right about that, because one thing I remember getting yelled at by a sociologist who knew Bourdieu well and pointed me to what I'm talking about right now was that I was taught Bourdieu as if the social, cultural and economic capital were completely distinct spheres. And you had power bars almost and like them and like, you know, you individually might have a lot of. But that's <laughs> that's not actually when when someone went back and told me to reread distinction without 
that lens that I was taught, I then saw that that wasn't what Badoo was talking about at all. That's just the way it's been used in America to basically right. justify our, I would like to call this our bureaucratic stratification system because I don't think anyone exactly invented it. It's just the way that like government bureaucrats actually do stratification tables like it is. So yeah, because there's like a tractable quantification variable that you can use to look at income brackets or something. I think that's ultimately what makes this most, and it's individualizing, which it's quantifiable and it's individualizing. Your crap. Love that shit. Yep. Um, Use it for but, means testing. Yay! Also, it, it does include the, like those first two causal things are a big deal in, when Marxists discover this, like, oh my God, like, <laughs> you know, I never really thought about that. You know, I, I know it's, it's not, sounds kind of like reductionist or unfair, but a lot of Marxists aren't maybe deeply invested in investigating their personal life and how they became who they are. And so at some point, usually Marxists discover their own sort of post-material needs and realize how these things came about. And then, you know, I don't know, that's where a lot of like the Frankfurt School or, you know, psychoanalysis kind of Marxist interest comes about, I think, uh, to be really deflationary. But, you know, that stuff also has an economic basis. And so there's like, I don't know, ha having this even in the sort of uh, maybe, you know, not understanding Bourdieu or, you know, kind of cutting it off from this or that, like incorporating these things is still a virtue. This is what I like about his approach is that you could still name the virtues and he calls this like a virtue centric sort of synthesis for a reason, because you can identify these processes, which, you know, they just like are in Marxist ideas of class. They're just not really well named. My experience of Marxists who go on about that kind of uh, social capital stuff that you hear in the media, most of them are like are literally using it to increase their social capital as much as they can. It's kind of like a self-help book for like becoming a new bread tuber. I, I, I remember reading a paper that was like, well, social capital is good, actually. Anarchists should use more social capital, which was like woefully pre-internet. And I wonder what that person thinks about social capital now. Yeah. Okay. So uh, stratification. So we're going to talk about what's missing from this approach. So he says here, four main points. Any consideration of the inequalities in the positions themselves that people occupy. Education shapes the kinds of jobs people get, but how should we conceptualize the nature of the jobs that people fill by virtue of their education? And uh, why some jobs are better than others. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Uh, why do some jobs confer a great deal of power? Like even within like the middle class, it always struck me, a, a friend of mine, she was studying to become an architect and like her architecture degree was so intense. And like another friend of mine was like studying to be a doctor or something. And they were probably just as intense. And uh, the doctor gets paid like literally five times as much. Even when it gets even to the middle class stuff, some of these things are just so, I don't know. They're so particular. Anybody want to take on some points here? What does he mean here by the inequalities in the positions themselves that people occupy? Um, like the underlying... Basically, like the under, like the underlying structuring relations at all. Like, yeah. So, like, both in like, okay, I'm a manager and I make so much money, and this person over here is a plumber and they make actually the same amount of money as me, and there are inequalities in these positions, both socially and also in terms of power and also in terms of production. There is a real sense in which, for example, if I'm a small business owner and I really truly own my capital, my income may be the same as any mid-tier worker, but I do have access to things economically, socially, but mostly economically, that other people don't. Like I can get lines of credit that workers just can't get, et cetera, and so forth. I also think that, you know, the inequalities in domination is not considered. And it's interesting that he puts domination in the Marxist category because he does, but like mm -hmm. he has to admit that it's actually absent in Marx like entirely because he talks about Marx talks about oppression and exploitation, but can't explain like non-owner boss relations. It does kind of come up in the idea of labor aristocracy and stuff like that. 
But if you look at the economy, Marx was writing about it so nascent at that time period that it really, you get why Marx wouldn't have wrote that much about it because it wasn't as big of a sector. But um, domination clears up a lot of stuff. Like, why do I hate my boss more than I hate my owner? And most people do. I mean, I personally don't because, you know, I'm a teacher and my relationship is my owner is technically the state of Utah. And my boss is another salary employee who sort of makes my job actually sometimes better, sometimes worse. But for most people, when I was working like at, at a, like, I don't know, a franchise, right? I didn't hate the franchise owner. I hated the head manager, right? Like, that's just the way I experienced domination. Are and, you telling me, Derek, that you don't hate Utah as a geographical area? No, no, I do hate you. I don't, but I, what I was saying is I actually hate Utah more than I hate my boss. Okay. My... <laughs> like, <laughs> I get you now. Um, get you now. Is it the wild cats? Is it the large wild cats that roam everywhere on the streets, taking people it, down like zombies? Is that is yeah? That, uh, right? that would make it way more fun. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> yeah. Um, like I know we've talked about what's missing in stratification earlier on as well. Is there anything here that people want to hit on before we move on to the next slide? I think we've covered it. I think yeah. we covered this. So the last slide on stratification, I think we should call a night after we finish stratification. Next week, we'll do the next section. So uh, stratification focus exclusively on the process by which individuals are sorted into positions, right? And the other two approaches analyze the nature of the positions themselves into which people are sorted, okay? So yeah, it doesn't... Stratification doesn't talk much about what it is to be like upper class versus lower class in relational terms. It doesn't talk about I exploit you, you exploit. It just talks everything at an individual level and it just looks at how they sort out in the end. It's like some kind of a Linnaeus, what would you call it? An exercise in classifying animals, you know, branches of animals or something. But it doesn't look at the process of evolution or, or or how these things happen that's a very probably a really bad analogy but i think there's something in that um it's typos and not i'm going to use aristotelian terms which is going yes. to right. so much more yeah. clear um but, it, <laughs> it, but it's it's topos and not relation so one of the things about stratification theory is that it's value neutral in a really pernicious way you can believe that like the classes are literally genetically distinct and that like the undermention are undermentioned because they're genetically inferior and believe in stratification theory. You can believe in meritocracy and believe in stratification theory, and you can be a kind of pinko socialist and believe in stratification theory if all you think socialism is about is distribution. So stratification theory has no bearing on which of those like interpretive frameworks you're applying to it because it's just about topos. It's just about where you are as an individual you can put any explanatory model as to why you are. So, yeah. Yeah, it's actually fitting to bring in Aristotle here, right? Because mm -hmm. Aristotle sometimes gets blamed for Western civilizations like fetish for categorization. But Aristotle was very interested in like the underlying rational mechanisms for why types emerge. So like... In a way, like if you are going to get like category obsessed, and when we're talking about class, we often get category obsessed. Um, you know, it is a better approach to start thinking about those underlying causal mechanisms. But you know, that doesn't mean you can't have fun sorting typologies or you know making rare Pokemon. I don't know. You can have fun with spreadsheets if you want. I'm not trying to yuck your yum there. Yeah, I, I think uh, you know just to sort of have a final statement on stratification, it is interesting that we got like very sidetracked in stratification discussion, like quite a lot. And I think it's not just because of the nature of our group, but because these attributes like really stand out to you in your mind. Right. And like, Oh, like all of these little nitty gritties of what it is to be middle class and the lived experience of middle class, like all this stuff is so tangible and like often is related to like visceral experiences. And so, yeah, there's, there's kind of a, a draw to this stuff and to that like Pokemon classification that you're describing Esri, 
uh, that maybe isn't uh, quite so present in the other two approaches, where it's a little bit uh, a little bit more abstract, a little bit drier. Like even though you know you're like talking about relations and like that's in a way like a more real thing, um, it's still very easy to fetishize the attributes and just like get sidetracked into that. Yeah, I think part of why we've been going off on this is because you deal with the stratification approach so much. That's for most people, even most, even a lot of socialists. I don't know about most. I don't know what to say there. It's like when you get objections to Marxism, it's like, oh, what? Are we supposed to all have like, you know, equal individual attributes? You know, I used to be very puzzled by that kind of response, but now I feel like I get it because. This is the way things manifest. I've been saying that over and over, but it's kind of a soft defense for a lot of tendencies and thought that drive me fucking crazy. There's a reason that people think about this one so much that this one comes up the most. It's because, you know, the active class antagonisms that you can perceive directly in your life, unless you're looking, you know, unless you're like really zooming in on like economic stuff, you know, the ones that like, sometimes get at you the most are these weird little affective things or when like somebody class sorts you by a habit you have or something. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Or when you do it to other people, right? Yeah. Like when you can tell that someone is from a background just because of, there's just something in the air around them. Like I can sniff out someone from like a, you know, someone that's class LARPing from a mile away. Why, why can you do that? Can you all smell the smell of cabbage off me? Like, can you smell that I'm Irish? Is that, <laughs> that's, that's through on. the computer, Tom. Yeah, true. Smell of vision. That's, that's some loud, dank cabbage. <laughs> oh, yes. You'll never guess what T-shirt I'm wearing today, though. Uh, my uh, Rapids O'Brien. My uh, Chief of the Rapids. Chief of the Rapids. Okay. All I think right. we'll- that's our last one. To, next week, we're going to uh, hit on to Weber and then Marx. And we're going to get into, look at this. Look at that lovely graph there. Look at that. Say, Weber, Weber is where we're going to get bogged down, man. If you think we got bogged down in stratification. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's a different kind of thing, you know? Like, with the stratification stuff, it's like, you know, oh, like, middle class people are like this this is the way they think and then you can just go on like this whole like mind tangent of like all these tangible attributes and affects that you hold or that you've experienced right which is different from like the theoretical nuances of vaburianism right well it's actually funny because i was thinking about that when i was in education they give you this book to read well i was still in education they give you this book to read about class it's called ruby Payne's understanding class and it is basically like you think this is bad or you think Verdu is it's like it's basically like here be working class people here are their values this yes. is what they don't have access to here be middle class people here are their values here they don't have access to and it actually is empirical work but it is totally uncritical of like the framework and it just like assumes it as like there's no even explanatory mechanism like here's why working class people would value relationships more than more than systemic you know like other people have to fill that in um which as a teacher is important to know like um but it's also just funny because i remember reading their description of like middle class values and working and poor values and they don't actually even talk about working class it's it's poor middle rich and i remember thinking huh it seems like since this book was written a lot of poor values have become middle class values and so on um you've had a value shift and I wonder why that is. Oh, you can't deal with that because you're just dealing with typologies. And that is the stratification problem. It's, it just ends up being typologies and doesn't explain it for the most part. Yeah, when we get on to Weber, we'll at least be talking about something Marxists need to vitally understand rather than something Marxists confuse with fundamental mechanisms all the time. Okay, on that positive note... Let's take it offline and we'll see us all next week, hopefully. And uh, we got halfway through one of these. So there is what, how many chapters? Like, oh, there's... I've tried my best. I tried the, my best. The, the chapters actually get easier to talk about, even though we'll get madder at them. I can't wait to plot that neoclassical econ graph of where the intersect is between uh, brevity and anger level. 
<laughs> On this episode, you heard the team tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening. And please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollar.